Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. My name is Scott Miller and I serve as your host each week. Today we have a phenomenal guest. It's Adam Grant of the amazingly popular, piercingly insightful book, Think Again. You know him well because he is the number one New York Times bestselling author of numerous books, including originals. He is a professor at the Wharton School, where for seven years he has been ranked as the number one favorite teacher, professor by all students. He has been in a former junior Olympic diver. He is the uh, host of a TED Talk that has over 25 million views. He's written numerous books. He hosts a podcast. He basically touches things and they turn to gold or diamonds. Adam Grant has joined us today. Welcome to On Leadership, Adam. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be here, and I'm pretty sure it's all downhill at this point. <laughs> well, like me, you have three children under the age of 12, so we expect a little twitching going on today if your household <laughs> is anything like mine. Adam, we've been chasing you for years. You and our CEO, Bob Whitman, had um, uh, some encounters and engagements a couple of years ago, came back to the executive team raving about your contribution at the conference he attended. And since your book, Think Again, was published, we are honored that you've chosen to join us today. For a bit of context for those listeners and viewers around the world, you hear a lot about best-selling author, right? A lot of people can anoint themselves as a best-selling author if their book hits a certain category at a certain time at a certain moment uh, on a certain site and they become a best-selling author. And I don't begrudge them because those are treasured accolades that many people work very hard for. And then there is Adam Grant, who not only is a number one New York Times bestselling author, his most recent book, Think Again, debuted recently and hit number two on the Amazon list. Now, not number two in some nuanced subcategory, but number two of all books in print sold. I believe it was um, only after former President Barack Obama's book, but imagine having the number two most wildly sold and read book in print. It is a testament to the value we're going to discuss today, Adam, in your book, Think Again. Before we start talking about some of your insights as an organizational psychologist at the Wharton School, Adam, will you give our listeners and viewers a bit of a reorientation to your journey, how you came to become a tenured professor at Wharton, and why you wrote Think Again. When I was in college, I was drawn to psychology and physics. I figured out very quickly that I had more to add in psychology than physics, so chose that as my major. <laughs> had no clue what I wanted to do with it, and then took my first organizational psychology class, and I was hooked. I realized that I could make it my job to study and try to fix other people's broken jobs. And so now what I do is I try to make work not suck. I get to redesign jobs to make them more meaningful and motivating. I get to try to build more collaborative cultures and teams and even more creative cultures and organizations. And I think most of us spend the majority of our waking hours at work, but how many of us can really find a sense of meaning and motivation in those hours we spend? So I wanna make our work lives and our whole lives more creative, more generous and more curious. Adam, you might argue the premise of this book is that rethinking is both a skill set and a mindset. Expand on that. Well, about three years ago, it was winter 2018, I went to a bunch of the most powerful CEOs in America, and I said, hey, I think hybrid work is going to be part of the future. Would love to run a remote Friday experiment. Just give people one day a week to work from anywhere, and we can test the impact on productivity and creativity. And they all declined. They said, we don't want to open Pandora's box. Right. Our culture might fall apart. People are going to procrastinate. This is not going to work. And now a bunch of those CEOs have announced that they might be permanently remote workforces. What a missed opportunity for them right? to say we could have had all of 2018 and 2019 to be practicing how to make remote work work and running this experiment as opposed to doing it while we're all afraid of getting COVID and trying to get things done while three kids are at home in online school. And I think the mindset was missing there, right? You, you had a bunch of CEOs who said, well, that's not the way we've always done it, or that's not going to work here. But also the skill set was missing, right? There wasn't, there wasn't a set of, of practices around saying, hey, you know what? We want to be a learning organization. Let's run the experiment and try to figure out what we can take away from it. Adam, one of our earlier interviews was of Dr. Susan David, of course, the Harvard medical school psychologist, the author of the phenomenal book, Emotional Agility. And in our conversation, she talked a lot about the, that the ability to change one's mind is a leadership competency. It is a demonstration of your ability to exercise 
emotional agility. Talk about um, perhaps the, the, the misnomer that changing your mind means perhaps you are a weak leader or that you're not operating on facts or your experiences are perhaps out of date. Why is changing your mind being able to rethink such a valuable skill set? Well, let's talk about what happens if you can't change your mind. Blockbuster, Blackberry, Kodak, Sears, Toys R Us. Should I keep going? Right, those, those are not leaders who failed at thinking. They're leaders who failed at rethinking, who couldn't pivot their strategies and their business models as the world around them changed. If we all lived in a stable world, it would be very easy to stick to your guns. But in a rapidly changing world, which is, I think, getting more dynamic over time, we have to be willing to recognize that the knowledge that we accumulated yesterday may not be relevant today. That the very things that made us successful in the past could cause our demise in the future. And I think that a lot of people look at leaders who do change their mind and say, what a flip-flopper. What they fail to realize is that you can stick to your values, but be flexible in your vision, your strategy, and ultimately your culture too. And that, that involves some consistency as well as some change. Um, one of my favorite demonstrations of the power of that comes from an experiment in Italy recently, where startup founders, they're all pre-revenue, were randomly assigned to either uh, go through a crash course in entrepreneurship or to go through the exact same course, but be taught to think like scientists. So they all go through three to four months of training. They learn how to build and run a business. What they don't realize is that half of them have been randomly assigned just to put on a scientist's goggles in the way that they run their startups. They're told your strategy, just a theory. Customer interviews, great way to develop specific hypotheses. And then your first product or service launch, that's an experiment to test your hypotheses. Over the next year, the entrepreneurs who have been randomly assigned to think like scientists bring in on average more than 40 times the revenue of the entrepreneurs in the control group. And the major mechanism that drives that effect is they are more than twice as likely to pivot. When they're thinking like scientists and they find out that their product launch fails, instead of doubling down and saying, well, I've got to prove to myself and everybody else that this is a good idea, they pivot. They say, you know what? Maybe that was the wrong product or the wrong market. And that kind of flexibility opens them up to growth. Adam, build on that concept of talking and thinking like a scientist. From a lot of your research, you propose that most of us think and talk like one of three professions. You call them preachers, prosecutors, and politicians. Would you define those three profiles, why we tend to think and talk like them, and how do they differ from thinking and talking like a scientist? Yeah, I think we, we all do this from time to time. When you're in preacher mode, you're convinced that you've already found the truth, and your job is to proselytize it and spread it. When you're in prosecutor mode, you're trying to win an argument and prove your case. And when you're in politician mode, you're essentially trying to win the approval of an audience through campaigning and lobbying. My big worry about these three mindsets is that they stop us from thinking again. Because if you're a preacher or a prosecutor, you've already decided you're right and other people are wrong, which means they might need to change, but you can stand still. And then when you go into politician mode, the danger is you're telling your audience what you think they want to hear, but you're not changing what you believe deep down. I think a good alternative is to think more like a scientist. And I don't mean that you should necessarily invest in a microscope or a telescope. You don't need to own a white lab coat. Thinking like a scientist to me means you value humility over pride and curiosity over conviction. It means you don't let your ideas become your identity or your ideology. And when you have an idea, you say, that's just a hunch. It's a hypothesis. Let me go out and figure out how I can run an experiment to test it. Adam, when I read that, you, you called one of those profiles also, I think, the totalitarian ego that our, I think you said, our inner dictator as leaders comes out to keep out threatening information that might harm our case or derail our momentum. Speak to the millions of listeners, business listeners or leaders that are joining us today. All of us have this sort of inner dictator that we want to keep out threatening information. What's the best way to exercise humility when we find that happening and save face and pivot from that? Well, one of the places that I learned from on this is super forecasters. So they're actual people who compete in tournaments to try to predict future events, like who's going to win the next World Cup or who's going to win the next election in your country. And they make their forecast. They also give a confidence interval. So how certain are they? And then they get scored on whether they were accurate and whether they had the right level of confidence. And if you look at these super forecasters, one of the things that they do differently is they change their mind differently. The average person in a forecasting tournament will make a prediction and then they'll update it twice. 
The super forecasters are distinguished not by how gritty they are, how hard they work, not even most importantly by how smart they are, their intelligence, but by how frequently they revise their forecasts. On average, they update their predictions twice as often. So instead of two revisions, they make four revisions. And the simple way that they do that, and I think this is something you can apply even if you're not a professional forecaster, is when they start to make a prediction, they make a list of the conditions that would change their mind. And that keeps them honest because they know once they've registered a forecast, they're going to start getting attached to it. It's going to get attached to them right, as part of their identity and their image, and they're known for it. And then they're going to feel pressure to defend it and justify it. If they make the, con the condition list at the outset and say, all right, I would change my mind if the following things happens, they buy themselves the freedom to be flexible. And I think that as a business leader, this is one of the first things you could do with your strategy. Right? You come up with your strategy and you say, OK, uh, this might change if there is a pandemic, if there's a recession, if there's a disruption uh, to my industry from the digital world, then I would revisit my strategy. And then if one of those conditions happens, you know it's time to rethink. Sounds like the preamble to every public company's earnings call. In the book, you, you talk specifically around the super forecaster in the 2016 political race between uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And you share some lessons there of what, what we learned from their forecasting pivots on Trump's win. What's the big lesson to be learned from what they got right and what they got wrong on the 2016 U.S. presidential election? Well, the, the forecaster who taught me the most on this is Jean-Pierre Bougam. He's actually a military historian by training. And according to the data, he's the world's most accurate election forecaster, maybe even the world's most accurate forecaster, period. It's not about what he knows. It's about how he thinks. He has, I think, two steps that we could probably all put into practice. One is he tries to separate his past predictions from his present identity. Instead of saying, this is what I believe, he says, all right, that's what I believed at the time, given the information I had. And when the facts change, I change my opinion. The second thing he does is he tries to separate his opinions from his identity. So he, he goes in and says, all right, I've got a forecast, but what I think is going to happen is not who I am. My identity is invested in finding the truth. And that means I'm going to stay flexible on what I believe in order to get closer to the truth. Um, a big part of his mindset is saying, look, I'm not here to prove myself. I am here to improve myself. And I think if we all adopted that mentality, right, if we said, all right, whatever bets I've made in the past, they might be wrong. The faster you are to recognize when you're wrong, the faster you can move toward being right. So, Adam, flip into professor mode. Pretend that all of us are fortunate enough to be in one of your Wharton Business School classes. Teach us the process of detachment. How do we detach from our past and, and make better decisions and change our minds? What are some of the reasons we don't and how do we detach? Well, I think we struggle with detachment for a couple of reasons. One is it's just a simple process that's called cognitive entrenchment, where you get a lot of experience in an area and you don't even realize that you're making assumptions that need to be questioned. Um, there's also the ego factor, right? You talked about the yeah. totalitarian ego a few minutes ago, uh, which can make it very difficult to hear information that makes you uncomfortable or that threatens your identity or your values in some way. But then there's also a social exclusion risk that if I detach from who I was in the past or things I used to believe, I might be rejected from my group and I don't want to do that. And so it's just easier to stick to my guns or maybe my gun bans, depending on where I, where I stand politically. I think if, if I were trying to teach detachment, the first thing I would do is I would borrow an exercise from a psychologist, Mark Leary, and his colleagues. They, they recommend taking the compassion that you normally offer to other people who need to change their minds uh, and trying to actually turn that inward to yourself. So write a letter to yourself about a false opinion you held or a time when you were wrong or a big mistake that you made and extend the same kindness and understanding to yourself that you would to a good friend that you cared about, right? So if your friend was wrong, you wouldn't say something like, of course you're wrong, you're a moron, you're always wrong, you're never gonna get anything right. But we say those kinds of things to ourselves all the time and that makes us defensive. Um, instead, if you write the letter and say, okay, you know what, here's a, a perfectly valid set of reasons why I got that wrong, here's what I learned from that experience, and how, here's how I'm going to prevent it from happening in the future, it becomes a lot easier to, to take the mistakes you've made and grow from them as, a, as opposed to being threatened by them. 
Adam, let's keep this lesson going one step further. Another previous interview was with Karen Dillon, the former editor of the Harvard Business Review. She co-authored many books with the former professor Clayton Christensen, who recently passed, and a former member of our board of directors. They co-wrote a book, I believe, with a third author called How Will You Measure Your Life? Phenomenal book. And in that book, they quoted a research study from another researcher that said that I think it was 93% of all organizations that had achieved, quote, financial success, did so with what they called an emergent strategy, not a deliberate strategy, meaning that only 7% of all organizations that had achieved financial success did it with the original strategy they set out. They had to pivot and change their mind and adopt an emergent strategy. To all the C-level officers that are also listening, including those at Franklin Covey, what are the kind of early forecasting signs that your basing your decisions on perhaps valid experience that's no longer relevant? How do you know when your ego and your hubris is um, dangerously high? I, I think this is probably more art than science for most people. But I would start by saying the thing that worries me most is when leaders make decisions based on intuition, right? There's this, this norm of, of decisiveness. You're supposed to project certainty and confidence, and that means you, know, you trust your gut. Well, my, my take on that is maybe you should test your gut. I don't know about you, but I do my thinking with my head, not with my gut. And the, the danger of intuition is that it's just subconscious pattern recognition. What you don't know is whether the patterns you've detected in the past mm. subconsciously are relevant to the current situation you're in. And so you wanna try to make those patterns conscious and then ask, okay, am I applying the right intuition? Or is my intuition relevant to the situation that I'm in? Uh, I was just talking with Danny Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner, about this on, on my Work Life podcast. And Danny said, I don't want to throw out intuition altogether. Because after you do the rational analysis, if you then add in your intuition, it will bring in information that you may have missed in the criteria that you're considering for making a decision. And his recommendation is, is not to throw out your intuition, it's to delay your intuition until you've either you know, done the analysis or run the experiment to try to figure out whether your hypotheses are right or wrong. I thought that was good advice. The other thing that I would, I would bring onto the table here is I had an interesting conversation a couple of years ago with Jeff Bezos. Whether you love him or hate him, he's obviously done an excellent job building Amazon into a powerhouse of a company. And I was interested in the question of when do you do your rethinking up front versus acting quickly and then be open to rethinking later? And what I took away from the discussion with Jeff was there are two dimensions he considers when making big decisions. One is how high are the stakes? And two is how reversible is this decision? If, if you're high on both, if you have an extremely important decision that you can't undo, then he wants to wait as long as possible to act. He will gather as much information as possible, do all his rethinking up front, uh, because the decision really matters and he can't change his mind easily tomorrow. If you relax either of those conditions and say, hey, you know what, not that consequential, or this is something I can reverse tomorrow, then he's very happy to, to act first and then rethink it on the back end. And I thought that was a nice two by two yeah. to think through when to rethink now versus when to rethink later. Adam, you earned your undergraduate degree at Harvard. And in the book, you quoted early on a fascinating research study. I think it was from 1959 at Harvard that had to do with some students. Would you take your time and kind of recreate the dynamic of that research study, and what is the lesson all of our listeners and future readers of your book should take from that? Yeah, this, is, this was a study that started in the, in the 1950s with Henry Murray, who was a psychologist who wanted to understand what he called interpersonal disputation, which was the process of challenging somebody's core beliefs and worldview. And he, he set up this pretty vicious attack where students came in thinking they were supposed to discuss their philosophy of life. Uh, they're undergraduates, and what they don't know is there's a law student who's going to come in and just tear their worldviews apart. They're recorded doing this, then they're, they're forced to listen to themselves, squirming and backpedaling and getting defensive and angry. And for most of the students, it was a miserable experience, uh, just horribly unpleasant. Uh, they got hostile, they got defensive, uh, they, they felt attacked, and a lot of them said they were scarred by it. What I thought was interesting, though, is there were a few participants who actually seemed to enjoy the, the whole experience. One said it was, uh, it was highly agreeable. Another even called it fun. And as I started to dig into this a little bit further, what I realized is it's possible to take joy, to find joy in being wrong. That it's a discovery that you've learned something. 
Or as Danny Kahneman put it to me, finding out that I was wrong is the only way I know for sure that I've learned anything. And I think that one of the ways that you can take more joy in discovering that you were wrong is to recognize that as the process of learning, right? To say, okay, if I, if I just have affirmed my conclusions, that's not learning, right? The point of learning is to evolve your beliefs, not to validate them. And that makes it a little bit easier than to, to grapple with those situations that we all struggle with where we feel like our views are under threat. Adam, I think Brene Brown has given the world now permission to be vulnerable. I'm not sure it's completely permeated the C-suite and most uh, for-profit organizations. Again, speak to the, the executive level leaders that might be watching or listening today, of which I spent a decade as one of those. There's a lot of pressure, right, to speak with confidence, to uh, project um, uh, a bold vision and strategy for the perhaps you know, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of colleagues that are trusting in you and trusting your strategy. How do you, how do you balance confidence and uh, assertiveness with vulnerability and the agility needed to change your mind? What, what advice would you give leaders on, on embracing the art of vulnerability basing their decisions on facts and not instincts and kind of like, how does that really come alive in an organization? It's tough. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's easy, but the leaders that I admire the most are the ones who have said there's such a thing as confident humility. I think of confident humility as being secure enough in your strengths to be upfront about your weaknesses, right? To be the kind of person who's willing to say, I don't know, and I was wrong, because you know, not only does that help you learn, it also models that behavior for everybody else in the organization, which makes it easier for all of us to admit our, our mistakes and then try to improve based on those, as opposed to hiding our errors and then repeating them and preventing everybody else from learning from them. And you know, I think we've, we've seen a lot of great examples of, of confident humility through the pandemic. Uh, you know, some of the best examples I've watched are Jacinda Ardern from a distance or Adam Silver up close, right? Being some of the fastest to move into, in New Zealand's case, a lockdown. Uh, in Adam's case, being the first sports league to say, you know what, we're, we're not gonna play. And in both cases, what I heard was them saying, you know what, we don't understand how COVID is spreading. We're not necessarily clear on how to prevent it or how deadly it is yet. And so given all that uncertainty, we wanna act quickly based on the best information what we have, that we have, but we're gonna keep doubting what we know. And we might change our minds tomorrow as, as better data come out, as new information emerges. And I think having the confidence to say, we don't know yet, we don't understand this, and therefore this is the protective action we're gonna take, that's a, that's a kind of confidence, right? A, a motivation to learn. Um, and maybe even show some of your work and admit that you're thinking your decision making is a work in progress. I think that's part of what I'm looking for in leaders. Um, I think one of the, the best ways that leaders can embrace that vulnerability is actually to, to go further than most leaders do. So I, I studied this recently with a doctoral student, Konstantinos Kudaferis. And we said, look, one of the ways that, that leaders can signal a confident humility is they can ask for feedback. They can say, tell me where I can improve. Tell me if you have any concerns or any problems. And we found that th that only temporarily makes people comfortable challenging and speaking up and telling leaders what to rethink. Um, over time, it fades because people don't know what they can raise safely. Sometimes leaders do get defensive. And even if people aren't afraid of speaking up, it could become an exercise in futility because leaders often don't choose to act on the information that's raised. We tried a different approach where we randomly assign leaders and managers to do something much bigger. Instead of asking for feedback and criticism, we said, hey, why don't you criticize yourself out loud? And some of the, the leaders and managers in our study actually took their own performance reviews from their bosses. And they said, all right, I'm gonna tell you what my weaknesses are and my development areas are, and I wanna work on those. And we found that when leaders had the courage to show that kind of vulnerability and say, you know, I, I need to work on my time management, or I'm trying to get better at delegating, or I'm trying to stop dominating a conversation and actually listen to the people in my team, that that boosted psychological safety and sustained it for at least a year because they were not just claiming that they were open to criticism, they were proving that they could take it and they were inviting their teams to hold them accountable for it. 
We found that when leaders show that kind of vulnerability, when they have the confident humility to say, here's what I'm bad at that I need to get better at, uh, not only does the team feel more comfortable challenging them in a constructive way, but leaders don't take any hit whatsoever to their image as competent. So I think that's, for me, one of the most powerful ways that leaders can show vulnerability is to know that the, the people around you are thinking critical thoughts about you anyway. You <laughs> might as well voice them and make it easier for people to share them. I actually wrote a book about that. Uh, thank you for sharing that. So beautifully said. I think one of the qualities I admire most in our CEO and Chairman Bob Whitman is the, the extraordinary calibration he shows around his emotions. This is a man I've known for 25 years. I've never seen him lose his cool. I've seen him close many times, but he does not lose his cool. You talk about a concept around how to get hot without getting mad. Would you expand on that? Yeah, I think this is a basic skill of emotional intelligence. So this, the original term actually came from a mechanic who watched the Wright brothers in action and was stunned that they would have these you know, hours long arguments, sometimes shouting and screaming about how to design a propeller. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was never personal. It was about, can we get the best ideas to make an airplane that will fly? Uh, and we obviously got to see the result of that there. I think that's what a productive conflict is. Uh, it's being able to disagree because we care about making the work better because we're trying to get to the best vision or strategy or product or service or culture, uh, not because we dislike each other personally. Um, in organizational psychology lingo, that would be, we're looking for task conflict without relationship conflict. And one of my favorite ways to try to get there is to know what your own emotional triggers are. So we all have triggers that can get tripped, right? There are certain kinds of events that cause us to fly off the handle or lose our cool. Um, I learned through writing Think Again that one of my emotional triggers is feign knowledge. When people pretend to know things that they don't, it just drives me insane because I wanna bring the best evidence to the table. And when I have a CEO who says, well, that's, that's not my, what my experience has shown. I just, I wanna say, yes, that's why I brought you randomized controlled experiments and longitudinal studies and organizations so that we could learn from rigorous accumulations of many people's experiences, not idiosyncratically from yours. And strangely, <laughs> that, that never goes well. And so knowing that that's one of my emotional triggers, uh, what I've written is a script for how I wanna manage that differently. And now whenever somebody objects to my data, I just wanna be humble and curious to say, you know what, I don't know what would change their mind. I'd really love to find out what, what would. <laughs> and so sometimes what I've asked is, you know, if I'm, I just would, I, I would really love to understand if you don't believe my data, why in the world did you hire me? Like, why am I here? Tell me more. And then in other cases, I've just, I've remembered to ask what evidence would change your mind. And what that does is it takes me out of prosecutor mode right, and out of preacher mode and into scientist mode where I really wanna understand what kind of data they find persuasive. And then we could talk through what a compelling study would look like together. And of course, we're also having the conversation on my terms, which is data driven. Not only are you a data nerd, you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'll Adam. try to live up to that. But now I, I do think that, that having a script is, is extremely helpful. Uh, I've, I've studied this recently yeah. and found that it's one thing to identify what your emotional triggers are and figure out those hot buttons. It's another thing to say, okay, when one of those buttons gets pushed, how do I want to respond? And then rehearse that often enough that it occurs to you in the heat of the moment. That's a great learning. Adam, what have you learned about the dangers of tunnel vision? And what are the signs all of us can look for when we find ourselves entering that metaphorical tunnel? Well, I think, when I think about tunnel vision, I think about people getting so locked into a goal that they don't stop to ask, is this the right path or even the right goal? Um, and we see this all the time in, in people making career choices, right? Where you get excited about a particular path and then you fall victim to what psychologists call identity foreclosure, where you settle prematurely on a sense of who you are and you basically close your mind to alternative selves. And then you end up having an early midlife crisis saying, oh, I shouldn't have gone, gone to med school or to law school or been an investment banker, right? Or whatever the path was. It's often people who got seduced by status and then didn't really consider whether the job that impressed other people would depress them day to day. I think when we, when we study how to escape tunnel vision, it's about having a different kind of network. Most of us like to lean on a support network, the group of people that encourage us, reassure us, cheerlead for us, and we all need those people, but we also need a challenge network. The group of people who are our most thoughtful critics, 
that we trust to poke holes in our plans and see the flaws in our strategies. Having a good challenge network is, is essentially the opposite of being surrounded by yes men and yes women who, when you come into the office in the morning and you say, good morning, they say, great point. Right? We, the challenge network is, is the group of people that you really trust uh, to, to take down your strongest convictions. And what I've been doing lately is I've actually reached out to a bunch of my most thoughtful critics and said, you may not know this, but I consider you a founding member of my challenge network. I haven't always taken your feedback well. Sometimes I've been defensive. Other times I've, you know, I've just dismissed it because I'm on a path and this seemed like a distraction. But I've always valued your perspective and your input. And if you ever hesitate to speak up because you're worried about damaging the relationship or hurting my feelings, don't. The only way you could hurt my feelings is by not telling me the truth. And so, you know, keep it coming. I have gotten much better feedback as a result of that. Uh, I was just uh, actually just getting ready to record a, a new TED talk. And I went to my challenge network and asked what they thought of the draft. And they said, this is not the talk you should give. Uh, and I, I really didn't want to hear it. And then the most important member of my challenge network, my wife, Allison, said, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is not the right talk. Uh, and that was a great opportunity for me to rethink it and start over from scratch. And I'm much happier with the result now. Adam, that was my favorite concept in the entire book was this idea of establishing challenging networks, challenge networks versus support networks. In fact, when you, uh, when you talked about it now, it reminded me of a friend of that I have that is a very uh, popular person. Everybody likes him, he's very kind, he's successful, he's genuine, he's honest, he's hardworking, he's looking at a side hustle, launching a business. And I have told him that he needs to surround himself with people that will poke on his idea, not just validate him, because he's very easy to validate. He's so likable. Take this concept a little bit further. When people are uh, creating a support network and perhaps a challenge network, what are the differences and what are the types of personalities you want in each? So... I, for a long time, thought, okay, you want givers in your network and you want to keep out the takers, right? I've been stud studying this dynamic most of my career. The takers are the people who are always asking, what can you do for me? And the, the givers want to know, what can I do for you? And I think we get fooled a lot by a personality trait called agreeableness. You will know agreeable people as warm, friendly, polite, welcoming, Canadian. <laughs> Disagreeable people tend to be more critical, skeptical, challenging, and also statistically overrepresented among engineers and lawyers. And I assumed for a long time that agreeable people were always givers, because if you're nice, you're also going to be helpful. Then I gathered data from over 30,000 people across industries and cultures and found a zero correlation between how agreeable, disagreeable you were and whether you tended to be more of a giver or a taker. What I learned was agreeableness, disagreeableness on the surface is basically how much harmony do you create, right? How much do you want to please other people and help them get along? Giving and taking are inner motives deep down. What are your real values and intentions toward others? And so I think that agreeable givers are great members of a support network, right? Those are the people who will say yes to everything. And it's helpful to have some of those people in your life. But you have to be careful because sometimes you get fooled by the agreeable takers, also known as the fakers, who are nice to your face and stab you right in the back. The people you really want in your challenge network are the disagreeable givers. Uh, you don't want disagreeable takers, right? Because they will, they will probably look for excuses to take you down. The disagreeable givers are the people who give you the critical feedback you may not want to hear, but you need to hear. They will play the devil's advocate. They will challenge the status quo. They will ask you the hard questions and they're doing it because they care, right? They're the people who dish out tough love. And so those have been the most valuable members of my challenge network. Adam, you are arguably the world's most renowned organizational psychologist. Complete this sentence for us. Great organizations become that way because... Great organizations become that way because they don't believe that people are the most important resource in their company. They believe that people are their company. Great cultures become so because... Great cultures become so because people are more interested in elevating each other than they are trying to be the smartest person in the room. And lastly, great leaders become so because... Great leaders become so because, oh, there's so many different answers here. Let me try to pinpoint one. Give us a few. Okay, great, great leaders become so because 
they believe in seeing more potential in other people than other people see in themselves. Great leaders become so because they're determined to not only recognize their weaknesses, but also overcome them. Great leaders become so because they see expertise not as a weapon to wield, but as a resource, excuse me. Great leaders become so because they see expertise not as a weapon to wield, yeah. but as a resource to share. Adam beautifully said, the author of the book, Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. Sir, you could have spent your time today doing a whole number of things, including parenting your three children and speaking around the world on behalf of all of my associates at Franklin Covey Worldwide. Honestly, Adam, thank you for your generosity, your abundance, your humility today, and sharing the insights from all your research, including Think Again. Last question. You know, we know a few things about books at Franklin Covey. Our co-founder, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, of course, authored the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This book has sold 40 million copies in 30 years. What is your process for researching and writing books that have wildly disproportionate impact? Well, I think I, I wasn't very deliberate about this when I started, but I've tried to reverse engineer the projects that have worked and compare them against the ones mm. that have failed. And I think what I've typically done in a successful book is I've started with the question of what, what am I passionate about? Right? I, I want to take a problem or a topic that I'm so fascinated by that four years after the book has come out, I'm still excited to share it and think about it. And my proxy for that is, do I talk with random people about this who aren't even in my field? Do I find it that interesting? And can I get them excited about it too? I think the second test is, is this important? If we understood this, this topic better, could we make the world a better place? Uh, and that helps me filter some of the things that I'm, I'm curious about, but don't really matter that much out of the equation. And then the third piece of the puzzle is asking, do I have something unique to say about this? Is there a novel contribution I can make? Right? Do, do we need another book on leadership? Probably not. Uh, do we need a book on rethinking, given all the books on thinking? I hope so. Uh, and if I can check those three boxes to say, okay, this is interesting to me, it's important to the world, and I have something of value that's distinctive to contribute to it, it feels like a project worth taking on. I'll bet you there will be hundreds of thousands of leadership books written in the future, and there probably will be some great ideas shared there. So uh, tell our audience, what is the TED Talk going to be about after all? Well, the, so the, the talk I wanted to give was how to open other people's minds. And the talk I ended up realizing that I needed to give was how to open my own mind. Uh, I realized mm. that I don't always mm. practice what I teach. There have been too many situations where I should have rethought my choices and I didn't until it was too late. And so I ended up deciding that I would give this talk about how to rethink your goals, your habits, and even your identity before it's too late. And uh, the, the metaphor that I use is the frog in the slow boiling pot that doesn't jump out until it's too late because it lacks the ability to rethink the situation, which is something that I've had to rethink in a pretty fundamental way. Adam Grant, if you ever need a side hustle, I'm sure we could use in the consultant in the Philadelphia area. Thank you again for your time. So look forward to having you back for a future conversation. Thanks for having me, Scott. This was such a delight. Love the energy. Thrilled to be here. Thank you, Adam. Hey, thanks for joining us. The book is a masterpiece. Think again. Still top 10 most widely read, purchased, uh, and read book uh, in print. Uh, pick up a copy. And what a delight today to have Adam joining us for our On Leadership series. We'll see you back here next week for another guest on Leadership. Leadership.